Welcome back everyone. I'm David Greenberg and my website is freedomvibe.art. And I want to give you a special welcome if you're brand new to my work. Just by way of a brief introduction, I am an animist, a multimedia artist, a content creator, and educator. And the topics we discuss here include natural law, the occult sciences, nature, psychology and mindset, health, healing and nutrition, consciousness, spirituality, conscience and morality, and of course, freedom. Today's presentation is entitled The True Meaning and Purpose of Government, a new perspective on a very old problem. As with all of my work, this is a solutions-oriented approach, and I strongly encourage that you watch the entire presentation in order to gain the maximum benefit from the knowledge I'm going to share with you. To help you get started thinking about this topic a little more deeply, I've curated a few quotes that I'd like to share with you. Now, as I read each of these quotes, I want to invite you to feel into the deeper truth of that quote. In other words, don't just understand it intellectually, but actually feel the truths that resonate from within those words. The heaviest penalty for declining to rule is to be ruled by someone inferior to yourself. Plato, the Republic. And although it doesn't say in the quote to rule oneself, that's how I understand this. So another way to say the same thing is, when you don't rule yourself, you can expect someone inferior to you to take over and do the job. A nation of sheep will beget a government of wolves. Edward R. Murrow. And I don't know about you, but when I look around the world today, this quote rings true at a very deep level. One more quote. Until you realize how easy it is for your mind to be manipulated, you remain the puppet of someone else's game. Avita Ochel. If there was ever a quote that could sum up what has happened in the world over the last three years in particular, this is it. So again, I'm just inviting you to feel into those quotes, to see what resonates, and to start to extract the deeper lesson as we dive in further. All right, so now I have a question for you. How many times have you said the word government in your life? And how many times have you heard it spoken or read it in some context? Depending on how old you are, you've probably used that word hundreds, if not thousands of times. And in fact, you've probably heard it or read it even more times than you've actually spoken it. So we could be talking thousands, if not tens of thousands of times. But here's the deeper question. Have you ever given any further thought to what that word actually means, the true meaning and the origin of the word. From my experience, most people really use that word without giving it any further thought. They just casually speak it or hear it and don't really think much beyond that. And you know what? I include myself in that group in the past until I started to dive in deeper. And I invite you to see if that's true for you and for people, the people that you have interacted with in your own life, from your own observations. But here's the thing. Considering how much government, as an institution, impacts and affects our lives, doesn't it make sense that we'd want to dive in a bit here? Doesn't it make sense that we'd want to understand this a little bit more? I don't know. What do you think? I certainly think that it warrants further understanding. From an occult scientist's perspective, the etymology or the origin of words 
is not coincidental. It's not just an accident. It's not something that is coincidence and without forethought or planning. Now, if you've already been following my work, you know exactly what I'm referring to when I say the occult sciences. But if this is something that's new to you, I want to encourage you to deepen your understanding. You may find it helpful to go back and watch some of my previous videos. And I did recently post a video where I explained more of what the occult sciences refers to. For now, I'll just mention that the occult sciences refers to sciences that are largely hidden. They aren't really taught. They're not taught in the what we can call main, the mainstream. They're not taught as part of public education, neither at the primary, secondary, secondary, or even at the college and university levels. However, this is a problem because words like government have deeper meanings and it's important to understand what those meanings are which is largely what we are going to be going into now in this lesson okay so let's take a closer look at the actual word government like many words in the english language this is a compound noun meaning it is a word that has been composed from two parts and those two parts are govern which itself is a standalone word and meant which is a suffix meaning it's not a standalone word it's a suffix that is added to the end of many other words in order to create a new word and a new meaning based on the original word and that's why i added the hyphen in front of meant to indicate that it is a suffix now what's interesting here is these two words are both derived from latin in other words each of these parts is derived from latin the first one govern is derived from the latin gubernare and ment comes from the latin mens mentis recall that in latin nouns have multiple declensions in other words they have multiple cases depending on their use so the same word can can morph can change again govern comes from latin gubernare and ment the suffix comes from the latin mens mentis okay great so now that we've identified the latin words that each of these parts of the word come from, we can dive in a little bit deeper to understand the exact meaning of each of those words. So let's take a closer look at the Latin verb gubernare. And of course, if, you've, if you're already well-schooled in Latin, this will probably be a review for you. So this is really more for the benefit of someone who has not explored the etymology of this word. So what does the Latin verb gubernare mean? Well, it means to control, to steer, to direct, to manage, to guide, to drive, and so forth. I think you're probably starting to get the idea. Now, I also wanted to make a small footnote here because, again, if you're not super familiar with Latin, this might be a bit confusing. You may wonder why there's a B instead of a V. And the answer is very simple. In classic Latin, there is no V. There is no V like in English. So when studying the etymology of words, we notice that certain letters change when going from Latin to English. And this is one of those examples. However, you can see a hint of this even in our own language. So, for example, in English, we have the word gubernatorial, such as gubernatorial race. What does that refer to? It refers to the race or the election of a governor. So, again, that same word. So, we can see it all ties back in. And that's a clue. That's a hint that that is the original Latin spelling of the word. Cool. So now we can talk about that suffix, meant. 
Where does this suffix come from? Well, it comes from the Latin noun mens mentis, or in the ablative case, mente, which means the mind, reason, intellect, or intention. Now, this is not a lesson in Latin, so I'm not going to dive in deep, and I encourage you, if you want to go and investigate the Latin language, definitely do that. Go look up how it works and go look up the cases or the declensions of nouns in Latin to understand why these words morph as they do. But ultimately, we can come to understand that ment, as a suffix, is derived from the Latin word that basically means the mind. So what about this suffix ment? What, what can we understand further from it? Looking a little closer at how English grammar works, recall that you've, know, you've probably seen this already and you probably already know this, but when we add the suffix meant to another word, basically what we're saying is that we're talking about something being in the state of, in a state of being in a certain way or meeting certain conditions. So, for example, the word judgment means the state of being judged. The word movement means the state of being in motion. And I'm not exactly sure how many of these words exist in the English language, but we can agree that there are actually many words that end in meant. And if you think about it for just a minute, you can probably come up with many, many examples. So now we're going to really deepen our understanding of this suffix meant and why this has been derived from the Latin noun meaning the mind. So let's dive in a bit. And this is really, really important. So I want to invite you to really pay attention here and especially if this is something that's new to you. So as I said earlier, from the occult sciences perspective, the reason why certain words are used to mean certain things is not an accident. It's not a coincidence. This is all very intentional. And one of the reasons why it is this way is because these words are always pointing to deeper truths, deeper truths about ourselves and the reality that we find ourselves in. And this, of course, in this particular case, is referring to the first principle of mentalism. This principle states, the all is mind. The universe is mental. In other words, everything that exists, everything that is in a state of being, starts first in the mind. And this principle is worthy of it, this principle itself is worthy of a lifetime of study and many initiates and many students of occult knowledge do spend a large time studying this but really the simplest way to think about it is all that exists you can think of it as one giant universal mind and everything that comes into being is basically manifesting because it is the, in the mind of God or in the mind of the Creator. Whichever word you want to use, the word is just a pointer to the concept. In the Hermetic traditions, they refer to it as the All because it encompasses everything. We essentially, every, we and everything else that exists are existing because we are in the imagination of the Creator of All. And in, by the same token, if you look at anything that we create in the world, any of the man-made, so-called man-made inventions and creations, all of them, without exception, started in the mind of someone. This computer and audiovisual setup that I'm using to record this presentation, somebody had to think about this. Somebody had to imagine it and think about it and think about how to create it first before it came into a state of being. And this is why meant, 
the suffix that means the state of being or the state of or the condition of comes from the Latin mind. So now we can start to put it all together and we can see that govern plus meant means to direct or control the mind, the intellect, or the intention. Or, to put it more concisely, mind control. Okay, so now over to you. And I've got a question for you because I want to invite you to start thinking about this a little more deeply. So, knowing that this is not an accident, knowing that it's not just a coincidence that this is the derivation of the word government, my question for you is the following. Why did the creators of the English language construct the word in this way? Why does the word for government actually mean mind control? Give that some thought. Maybe you found an answer immediately. Maybe it's something that you want to perhaps contemplate a bit. But once you have an idea, I want to invite you to comment below the video and share your thoughts. What do you think? This is probably going to help you as well. I want to invite you to notice something about that word and the meaning. In particular, notice that the word government omits to explain who is in control of the mind. It doesn't say who it is. It simply says that someone or something is controlling the mind. But it never tells you who that is. And this is actually of great significance. In order to understand this a little bit deeper, I want to remind you of the second principle of Hermeticism, the principle of correspondence. As above, so below. As within, as without. In other words, the universe is self-similar across all scales. That is, the microcosm of our inner domain, the psyche or the mind, is a reflection of the nature of reality as a whole. And of course, it goes without saying that if you haven't done so already, I strongly encourage you to learn as much as you can about the Hermetic principles. The Hermetic traditions is just one tradition that's pointing back to universal truths. So, but it is one that is very, but it is one that is very accessible. And in particular, I can recommend a book. It's called The Kaibalion. I'll provide a link somewhere below the video. You can either acquire the book, you can download it, or you can even listen to the audiobook. It's readily available on YouTube and elsewhere. So if nothing else, I encourage you to go and read that book at least once and see if you can grasp some of these deeper meanings. But the second principle of correspondence is very important because it's what allows us to, to reason and understand the nature of all of reality by understanding ourselves and by understanding the smaller domain first. So again, we can better understand how reality works by extrapolating from the nature of ourselves. And this is why those of us who study the occult sciences, those of us who have been initiated into this realm, we are always saying, and I in particular am saying, that one of the most important things that you can do is to know yourself. And when I say know yourself, I'm not just talking on a superficial level, as most of us do and as I used to think it meant. I'm talking about going deeply into understanding yourself, your nature, and all aspects of you, your strengths, your weaknesses, and so forth. Now let's go back to this concept of the mind, having the, keeping what I just said in mind. 
So, we can agree that when we talk about the mind, there is always something or someone that is controlling or directing your actions and behaviors. So think about this in context to you. Something or someone, some force, some consciousness is controlling you and directing your actions and behaviors. Now, in nature, meaning naturally, meaning the way it is naturally, you are the one who's directing your own actions through your own choices. And this, of course, refers to free will. You're the one in charge of you. This is the natural way. You're the one making the choices because you have been gifted with free will. But what happens when you abdicate ownership of your mind for whatever reason? And this does happen very often, as we're going to see. What happens when you reject the gift of free will? When you attempt to put someone else in charge, let someone else make the decision? What happens in that case? Well, the answer is actually very simple. Someone or something else outside of you takes over and you become like the puppet. You become like the puppet who is moving, who is doing things, and it seems like acting autonomously, but really someone else is pulling your strings. And it is principally the psychopaths. Yes, you heard me correctly. It is principally the psychopaths who take external control of the mind. And this is a topic that I'm going to be diving deep into very, very deeply in an upcoming presentation, possibly even more than one. Because in order to really understand why things are the way they are in the world right now, why the current human condition is the way it is, and why we are suffering so much as a civilization, as a species, you have to understand psychopathy and psychopaths. There is no getting out of this. So unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to dive in too deeply into this topic in this presentation. However, since I brought it up, I want to at least share some main points to again, to kind of get you thinking about this and exploring it on your own. And in the bibliography, I will include some references, some books and other references that you can look into. In particular, I would like to strongly encourage you to check out the work of Thomas Sheridan. He has done great groundbreaking work through his books and his lectures and his own research onto the nature of psychopaths and psycho psychopathy. But as promised, here's just a quick review of psychopaths so you can start to understand why things are the way they are. Of course, I'm referring to primary psychopaths, meaning they're born this way. They're born as psychopaths and they cannot be cured there is no therapy, there is no healing, there is no treatment. There is nothing that can be done to change their nature, period. It's been estimated that they are about 1% of the human population. Some people put it that number higher. This is really an educated guess because we don't have a census. We can't know with 100% certainty. But this is a reasonable guess. And in certain professions, that, that number will actually increase. In other words, in a Wall Street firm, it's likely that the percentage is higher than 1%. That's about one out of 100 people. So you can, for most people, and I, I for one have definitely known psychopaths in my own life, 
and I was even in a relationship with someone who I'm pretty sure was a psychopath. Again, it's sometimes it's hard to be 100% sure, but a lot of the warning signs were there. So what does the word actually mean? Psyche plus pathos. This comes from the Greek. This comes from the Greek. It literally means an illness or a suffering of the mind. What is the illness? Well, certain parts of their brain, specifically the limbic brain and the amygdala, the amygdala and the frontal neocortex are actually disabled. It's not that they're diseased, it's not that they're damaged, they are not damaged, they are disabled. They are non-functional. Psychopaths literally don't think like we do and they cannot think efficiently and rapidly like we do. They cannot relate to things in the way that you and I can. They don't feel emotions. They don't feel emotions like you and I do. Whereas you and I experience this rich, broad range of emotions that largely def defines our humanity, psychopaths don't have that ability. They don't feel fear. They don't feel joy. They don't feel love. They are incapable of feeling anxiety, depression, compassion and understanding. They never feel shame. They are never guilty. They never feel remorse or regret for anything that they have ever done. And they never will. Having said that, they do feel in quotation marks or experience certain states of being that might be likened to an emotion, largely boredom. They're constantly getting bored, which is why they're constantly scheming and they have to always be up to something. And they often feel rage or what could be akin to rage when their plans don't go as planned or when someone interferes with their plans. All psychopaths, men and women, have unusually high levels of testosterone. That's why some people have described them as having kind of a shiny glow to them, to their skin. An unusual sex drive, co constantly ready to get into bed with someone. And they, in order to feel alive, they are constantly seeking those dopamine and serotonin hits because that's part of what allows them to feel alive as it were to, to actually know that they exist so that's why they're constantly pushing it with their schemes and their plans because it gives them those hits of dopamine and serotonin in their brain but essentially they are automatons they are not human in the way that you and i are they are empty inside there is no soul there is no heart in the way that we have it they're like very sophisticated automatons. They're very good, they're very intellectual, and they're very good at mimicking human emotion, which is all they can do. And that's, what they, that's the primary way that they manipulate. They put on a persona, they, they create a persona, and they act a certain way, just like an actor in a film starts to take on a certain character in order to convince you that they are actually that character. So that's what a psychopath is doing through the entirety of their lives. And they are very clever. They're very clever, they're very devious, they're very cunning. They are predators. But ultimately, when it comes to true intelligence, they are very stupid. And everything that they do is ultimately leading to their own demise. It's a downward spiral to their destruction. It's only a matter of how long it takes for them to get there. And here's something really important to keep in mind, which ties back into what we're talking about today, is that all the institutions of the world, all the major institutions are all psychopathic. They're all designed by psychopaths, by the psychopathic mindset, and for the same purpose that the psychopath creates in his own, his or own individual life in order to control and manipulate. Cool, so just to tie it all together, 
when we talk about government, whether we're talking about an external form of government or an internal state of government, it's inevitable. One way or another, someone is going to be controlling your mind. The only question is who? It's either going to be you or someone else. And having said that, we're about halfway through this lesson. So I'm going to take us into a short break. And, I, and during the break, I want to invite you to sit with and contemplate what we've talked about so far. And I'll be right back. Right. Welcome back, everyone. So let's continue. So kind of taking it back to the start of this discussion in context, we can agree that we're all very familiar with this concept of external government. It's we're familiar with it because we've been living under its influence for our entire lives. You have, I have, we all have. It's very rare at all to meet someone in the modern world who is not living under the influence of government in one way or another, external government. But when I speak of internal government, what does that actually mean? What is the nature of internal government? How does it manifest? And what happens when it does? What does that actually look like? Furthermore, why should we even strive for that state? Why is that even important? Why should we care? Going back to something I said earlier, you have been gifted with free will. What that means is you always have the choice. In essence, Free will is a gift. It's a gift from creation to you, to you and I have it too and all of us have it. Essentially, free will is saying you get to decide. You own your own mind. You, go, you get to make the choice. 
Yes, it is true that you do not control the entire reality and there are circumstances and conditions that are outside of your control. Absolutely, that is certainly the, the case. However, within your own domain, within domain, within your inner domain, you are the ruler. You can be the ruler. You, you are gifted with kingship or queenship of your own mind. And this is something that a lot of people are going to resist. And there's a lot of deception and misinformation about this. But the bottom line is you always have the choice. You cannot not have the choice. Even when you think you don't, even if you don't believe, even if you make a claim and say, oh, free will doesn't exist. I don't believe in free will. It's all just a, it's all up. God is doing everything. Or it's all just like a, a random giant machine, deterministic machine. There is no actual free will. See, you can make these claims because you have the free will to make a claim, to deny it. That's the point. You, you're the one who's making that claim. So even when you deny your free will, you're the one that's choosing to deny it. You see how that works? You can never get out of it. So even when you think you don't have a choice, that is incorrect. You always have a choice. You may limit your choices based on what you believe, but you always have the choice. Now, having said that, some somebody's going to interject and say, but hang on a second, David, we can't possibly act entirely from consciousness everything that we do some many things that we do are unconscious for example or come from the subconscious such as even walking even driving a car once you learn how to do it people have completely zoned out but they still are able to drive safely because their subconscious mind takes over and i agree and we do largely operate on habits and that is by design i've talked about this and other i've talked about this and free will in my other presentation called Understanding Human Nature. And actually, if you haven't watched that presentation, I want to strongly encourage you to go back and watch it because that material is actually foundational for everything that we're talking about today. So definitely take some time to go and watch that one as well. But yes, I agree. And I can attest to this from my own experience in my own life that I've seen how this has played out in my own life. Yes, we do operate largely in habits. But we are always the choice, the point of choice for what we allow ourselves to be programmed with. That is the key. And we always have the choice to remove programs, to change them, and to add new programs. So this does not obviate free will. It's simply an additional layer that we become consciously aware of. And when we become the cause point, we become the masters of, of that programming. And this is why this path is so important. This is why working on yourself and personal development is so, so important for you to be able to master this. So let's talk a little bit about morality. What is morality? Morality is not a, is not a concept that is owned by any particular religion or even by any religion. Morality is very simply the embodiment or the state of self-ownership that is in harmony with others who are also in the same state. Again, the principle of correspondence, as within, as without. There is a, a self-ownership and a respect for self that is then re outwardly reflected towards others who are also in the same state. And that is what actually allows many individuals to live together in peace and not tear each other apart because they are, in a, they are acting morally. So as you can see, morality is actually ge what generates freedom. And in many respects, it's not an exaggeration to say that morality is freedom. So when you are moral, you 
are your own government. Let me say that one more time because it's so, so important. When you are moral, you are your own government. So what does that mean? That means you have accepted and, re and recognize and accept ownership of your own mind. You control it. You accept responsibility for all of your choices. This is also what has been termed property rights. And again, I've spoken about rights on another presentation called Knowing Your Rights that I also encourage you to check out. But, but acting morally, you become your own government. Now this state of being can go by different names. And each of these terms can help us to understand it a different aspect of the same thing. We can call it morality or acting morally. Internal monarchy, which happens to be the name of one of my upcoming live presentations in September. It's called cultivating internal monarchy. It's also called self ownership or one of my favorite terms, sovereignty. Sovereignty also comes from the Latin sovereign, which comes from the Latin super. Again, there's no V in Latin, so super, above or beyond. And regnum, which means rule or rulership, as in the rule of a king or queen, the rule of a monarch. So sovereignty, sovereign literally means above rule. In other words, having no masters. Now morality, again, being your own government, consists of three things. And here's again that concept of a trinity, which appears many times in the occult. The concept of trinity is a very powerful, three is a very powerful number, and the concept of three things in one is very powerful. It's a very stable and powerful concept. So we're gonna see it often. So what is morality? It, in modern culture, there's a lot of confusion around morality and even religion contributes often to that confusion, but it's actually very simple. It's really only three things. Self-ownership, non-aggression, and self-defense. So just to add a little more context, you own yourself, meaning you own your own mind and you take full responsibility for all of your actions. You don't cause harm to others. You respect their sovereignty. You respect their self-ownership. And if someone, be it a psychopath or anyone, comes along and tries to harm you, you defend yourself. You do whatever is necessary to put a stop to that immediately. Okay, so now I have another question for you. What do you think happens when you or someone or most people reject morality, meaning they reject or refuse to embody one or more of those three aspects of morality that we just spoke about. Well, again, let's go to the sixth principle of Hermeticism, which is the principle of cause and effect. Again, one of the reasons why having a deeper understanding of the Hermetic principles is so important in context what has also been called the expressions of natural law. Just to remind you, we live in a reality which is based on cause and effect. So you can bet your ass that when many people or most people reject morality, there's going to be a consequence. What is that consequence? It is the manifestation of external government. That is the direct consequence of the rejection of morality. Interestingly enough, external government is actually the inverse of morality. How can we understand that that's true? Well, let's take a look at it vis-a-vis -vis the three principles of morality. So the first principle was self-ownership, but when we talk about external government, you abdicate self-ownership and you become a citizen, which if you look up the definition of what a citizen actually is, it's basically a, a glorified slave or indentured servant, someone who is working for and is basically owned by the government. 
So you no longer own yourself, you no longer own your own mind, uh, or at least you claim not to. You can never truly not get, not own your own mind, but you're basically acting as though someone else owns you. What was the second aspect of morality? Non-aggression. Well, what do we see very clearly when we look around the world at external government? It is, it is a non-stop violent aggression. It is constant violence through wars, through policing, through imposing restrictions, through mandates. It never ends. The number of people who have been murdered by any kind of government in the last century is staggering. I've heard different estimates, but it's all the estimates I've heard are in the hundreds of millions. So just put that in perspective. And then what was the third aspect of morality? Of course, it's self-defense. So when we have external government, external government says, hang on, nope, you don't get to defend yourself. You're not allowed, in fact, you're not allowed to. Only the police are, only the military is. We get, we're gonna take care of you. You don't get to defend yourself. And they make it harder and harder and harder, and in some cases even impossible for the citizens, i.e. the slaves, to even obtain a weapon to defend themselves, such as a gun, a firearm. So we can see very clearly that external government is the complete opposite of morality. And in fact, it is a true statement to say that external government is always immoral. Let's look a little closer at some of the comparisons between internal and external government to really kind of draw out this contrast. Internal government exists naturally. This is the natural state of things. External government must be artificially created and maintained. Internal government is based on self-ownership. You own yourself. You own your mind. You own your body. You own you. External government is based on rule by others. You're just a citizen or a slave. You have to obey or you'll be punished. Internal government respects the principle of non-aggression. In other words, you respect others' self-ownership and you don't cause harm. You don't initiate violence against them. You don't take that which doesn't belong to you. External government is always, 100% of the time, based on violence and coercion. The only differentiator is the degree of violence and coercion that is operated. That might mark the difference between, say, a democracy and a dictatorship, but ultimately both the democracy and the dictatorship are based on violence. Internal government respects the principle of self-defense. You have a right to stop others from harming you at all times. And you can do whatever is necessary to make that happen. In external government, you essentially give up that right and you are now protected by the police. And really, you're not protected at all by them. That is not their purpose. That is their ostensible purpose. But that rarely bears out because as you know, even if a police officer is good intentioned, they're always gonna show up after the fact. Now let's dive a little bit deeper into the mindset difference between internal and external government. Internal government is based on unity consciousness. What is unity consciousness? It means that the three expressions of your consciousness, your thoughts, your feelings, and your actions, they're all in alignment. There is no internal contradiction. As you think, as you feel, so you act. Everything is in harmony with everything else within. External government, on the other hand, manifests when internally you are in a state of chaos. You are experiencing cognitive dissonance. There's an internal contradiction because that is the only way that you can allow an immoral state to exist outside of you. What is the result of internal government? Well, it generates freedom. More freedom, not just for yourself, but for everyone. The, it, it levels up. It helps to ramp up the level of freedom for all of us together. What is the manifestation of external government with respect to freedom? 
It's the exact opposite. It generates slavery. It removes freedom and reduces the amount of freedom that we all experience. And finally, when we, when we are living and embodying internal government, the, this is actually what enables the maximum creative potential of our species. This is what maximizes what is possible. So if you think about all the things that we've been dreaming about, for example, exploring the universe, being able to solve problems of energy so that everybody has access to unlimited energy in the world, basically unlocking these next levels of experience, that all comes out of the manifestation of internal government. On the other hand, external government, which is what we are experiencing right now, limits reality and puts us into a box. It's, it's a very narrow range of possibilities. And when we attempt to go outside of that narrow range, then we are punished by the system itself. So this is just an outline of the major differences between internal government and external government. And I invite you to contemplate that and maybe see if you can come up with some other examples on your own. So I just want to go back and stress this one point that I've already made again because it is so, so important. And that is this. You always have the choice. Whether or not you believe that's true, whether you actively claim to the contrary, whether you reject that notion, whether you understand it or not, you always have the choice. You get to choose. You get to choose. Do you want to rule yourself? Do you want others to rule you? There is no middle point there. It's either one or the other. However, again, cause and effect. We live in a universe of cause and effect. When you abdicate self-rule, when you reject it, you are the subject of others. You are ruled by others. It's really that simple. So I want to invite you to just contemplate, just observe the world around you. Take it all in. Obviously, you've been alive for a certain amount of time and you have been observing. So just kind of aggregate what you've seen so far in your life and what you're seeing right now. What can you conclude about that? If we're being honest with each other, we have to conclude only one thing, that we live in a world where most people are actively rejecting or denying self-ownership. They're abdicating rule of themselves. It's really not possible to come to any other conclusion based on what we've seen so far. But now I want to ask the deeper question because that's what I'm all about and this is how we come to solve these problems is by understanding the causality, the chain of causality, and then acting upon the root cause. So my next question is why? Why? Why is this happening? What is or are the root causal factors that are, that are generating this state where most people are rejecting self-ownership? Before I give you my perspective on the answer, I'd love for you to comment below what your thoughts are. So why do you think this is? Go ahead and comment below. So now let me share with you why I think this is the case. And I share this based on my own personal experience. In other words, the way that I used to be and the healing that I've had to do for myself, as well as what I've observed in others through the entirety of my life. So what I have observed is that most people live in a constant state of fear, albeit at a low level. In other words, it's not an open, overt level of fear that you can literally see it on their faces. Yes, you can see it on their faces, but it's more the subtext. And in my experience, 
most people do not truly love and respect themselves. And I say that because if they did, they would naturally embrace self-ownership. Now this state of self-loathing, as I said, it's not always on the surface. In fact, it's very often not on the surface. You have to look within to see it. You have to go inside. It's often buried within the subconscious mind and it expresses through internal chaos and through contradiction, internal contradiction, where the person acts and behaves in a way that is actually against their own nature. You're actually allowing yourself to go under harm. And I say this because a person who truly loves and respects themselves would never allow that to happen. They would embody self-ownership, the natural state of things. They will accept and understand that they own themselves. A person who truly loves themselves will not harm others because they will see and understand the way things work, that harming others is essentially harming themselves. And they will defend themselves and not allow others to step on them or their rights. So we can see this very clearly, that this state of self-loathing is prevalent. It is an epidemic. As I said, I know this from first-hand experience. And yes, that is a photo of me from about, oh, maybe just eight or nine years ago, roughly. I'm not 100% sure. I think it's about eight or nine. It could be seven or eight years ago, somewhere in that time frame. And at that time, and for most of my life, or pretty much all of my life up until that time, I was in that state of being, of self-loathing. I did not truly love and respect myself. This is why I can speak about this so definitively because I know what it's like. I know exactly what it feels like. And I also know that it's a state that we can heal from. It's not permanent. And that's always the good news, right? That is the good news is we can evolve out of that state, which is one of the main reasons why I've created this presentation and actually all of my work is to help you come out of these states of consciousness and evolve into the higher states to manifest at a higher level. So again, this is a solutions oriented approach and because we live in a universe of causality, we want to understand the causal factors that lead to these conditions. So obviously every one is individual. I had a specific set of circumstances just like you do. But if we were looking at it collectively, if we were considering this as a problem for all of humanity, then we can identify a common cause. And the common cause that I have identified through my research is trauma, specifically the trauma of having been abandoned. Abandoned by whom? By our parents and by extension, by society as a whole. Now, I want to point out something here. When I say abandoned, that's not only physical abandonment. That's not only, for example, putting your child up for adoption or leaving, you know, one parent or one spouse just leaving the other with the child physically. Of course that happens and it probably happens quite often, sadly, but that's not the only form of abandonment. Abandonment can be psychological where the parent checks out from their role because parenting is a very active and important role that requires a lot of conscious intention. I talked about this more in a recent presentation I did called How to Raise Children. Parents can abandon their children in many dimensions, psychologically, emotionally, not being there for the child. Even if it doesn't happen all the time, abandoning them spiritual, spiritually, delivering them into a religion without checking with the child and allowing the child the space to cultivate their own 
connection with creation. Because as we know through the principle of correspondence, as within, as without, you and I and all of us, we already have divinity within us. We are already directly connected to all of creation. We don't need an intermediary. We simply need to go within and need to be given the chance to cultivate that inner knowing and reconnect with spirit from within. So a parent can abandon the child spiritually, and I would even say abuse them, by forcing them to adopt an external or an exoteric religion instead of allowing them to naturally cultivate their own connection to creation. So this abandonment can happen on many different levels. And it is not a coincidence that many people, they look up to government, meaning the external form of government, and they look to it as though it were a parent figure. Mommy or daddy government, or both. Often it's both, different aspects of government fulfilling different roles as a parent. So we can see that you can literally see this in the way people talk about what they expect from government. They expect to be protected, the police and the military, for example, the judicial system, lawyers and judges, the court system, child protection services, and so on and so forth. And they also expect to be provided for the minimum wage, the universal health care, um, the no child left behind, and so on and so forth. We can see it in all the different ways. And we can, we can come up with more examples. But all of that basically paints this, a picture that you can see that individuals who are accepting external government, essentially they're all looking for the government to take on that role of either mommy or daddy, or in some cases, both. Now, remember that we spoke about the psychopaths, the predators, and they are predators. They're, they're essentially an intraspecies predator. They predate on us from within the same species, or we could call them a subspecies. But they're the ones who created and run the world's government. Basically, they prey on people who do not who will not govern themselves, who, who will not accept full responsibility for their own internal governance. Those are the people who are the perfect prey to the psychopath. Because someone, again, who is in full sovereignty is not going to fall for their deceptions, is not going to be roped in and fooled they're one who's much more likely to rat them out, to see them for who they actually are, and to ha want to have nothing to do with them, much less to accept their machinations and their, the institutions that they, or policies that they intend to push on others, which are always psychopathic. And you can tell they're psychopathic because they always have an undertone of, of what? We need to get rid of humans. Human beings are bad. Human beings are evil. There's too many people. Human beings are destroying the planet. If you take a close look, you'll see that's always the underlying message. That's how you can tell that it was created by a psychopath because they want to prey on us and they, they want to get rid of us. Their ideal world, their transhumanist utopia is in fact hell for humans, but for them, it's all they want. It's all they seek. These psychopathic predators. And they see, if you don't govern yourself, they, they only see you one way. It's like, a, it's like the prey, ready for the hunt. It's almost like they're saying to you, if you won't govern yourself, then we are gonna do it. And we get to decide how. And if you want to explore this ideology and topic better to understand it better, you might want to look into such psychopathic ideologies that were outlined in, for example, Silent we Weapons for Quiet Wars. Or you might want to look at books, read books like 1984 by George Orwell, just to get a better understanding of the kind of reality that 
these psychopaths want to create for all of us. So what is the solution? I've explained everything very clearly to now. Hopefully you're, you can understand everything that I've shared. And I've made the problem very clear and very obvious. But as I said at the beginning, this is a solutions oriented approach. So of course, we have to ask the question, what is the solution? Well, the solution is very simple. The solution is you need to be your own government. You need to accept ownership of your own mind at all times. Now, in order to do so, you have to know yourself. Recall it a while back, I mentioned that, that know thyself is one of the most important declarations in this path, in this work. Understanding the self, going deep within. What does that mean? You, you and I, we're each individuals. We, we are universes unto ourselves. So you, in order to govern yourself, you need to learn about you. You need to understand your strengths and your weaknesses. Both are important. You need to understand how you can be exploited, maybe how you have been exploited in the past. And I've done that and it's, it's been painful. It's, it's painful to admit how easily I was conned and duped and scammed and defrauded in the past when I didn't understand how things work and most importantly, when I didn't truly understand myself. So you need to do that. There is no skipping this step. There is no quickly pressing fast forward through this. You've got to go through it. There's only going through it. And that means taking the time every week, maybe even in the beginning every day, to sit in quiet contemplation and go within. And obviously, with the help of others who have already gone down that path so that they can help show you the ropes. Now, this inner work has often been called, is often called shadow work. This is a very common term that uh, you, if you've been paying attention and have approached spiritual work in any capacity, you've almost certainly come across this term. It would be hard to believe that someone who has not at least heard the term. So what is shadow work? What it entails is you going within and facing directly, looking directly at aspects about your psyche that make you uncomfortable. These are essentially the things that you don't really want to see about yourself, that you don't even like about yourself. This includes understanding your weaknesses and how they allow you to be controlled by others. The, we can call them the hooks, where others can put their hooks in you. The programs, the beliefs, whatever it is, whatever is going on in that inner realm that is allowing you to be externally controlled. And again, to be deceived because all external control, as we have seen, is a deception. It is based on lies. It is in opposition to that which is true and that which is natural. So, you know, I'm gonna be honest with you, this is hard work. This is not easy to do. I'm not gonna sugarcoat this. It is simple in that the path to it and what needs to be done is, is straightforward, as I have explained it. It is simple as the truth always is, but I'm not saying that it's easy. And the more you've put this off and the more you've accumulated this kind of, we can say, I mean, let's, let's not euphemize it. This trash, this accumulated junk in your psyche, these programs that are running your ass, to be blunt about it, and are mirroring what's going on in the external world, that, that's so much more that you're going to have to do. No one's going to be able to solve it all in a day. And again, if some religious guru or some, you know, expert comes along and claims that they can heal you in a day, they're lying to your ass. And if they want to charge you 
a lot of money, i.e. thousands of dollars, if not more, to do that, you need to get the hell away from them because they're full of shit. Again, that doesn't mean that we can't get help from others to facilitate this, but it's not easy. But I can tell you from personal experience, having been, I've been doing intense shadow work now on and off for just over two years. And I can tell you that it is absolutely worth it. That I can say with certainty, it is absolutely worth it. And as you start to reap the benefits of that, you will discover that for yourself. So again, just to remind you what the goal is. The goal is self-governance. What does that look like? Kind of putting it all together from what we've discussed so far. Number one, self-ownership. You own your mind. You own your body. And you own all of your actions. What does that mean that you own it? It means that it's your possession. It means that you are responsible for everything that you do. For everything you think, feel, and do. You take responsibility for your actions and for their consequences. Even though we can't always know what's going to happen. Right? Because there is an, there is an aspect of reality that we don't know exactly what's going to happen when we act a certain way. We can take an educated guess and we can often be right, but we don't truly know until we do it. So you take that responsibility. Now you reflect all that outwards towards others. You give them the same respect that you give yourself. You don't try to harm others. You don't manipulate them. You don't try to use them for your benefit. Everything is only voluntary. It's all collaborative. If someone else wants to interact with you so you can achieve something together, that's awesome. But it's only if they truly want to. It means you defend yourself, both physically and psychologically. And that latter is very important because especially when we're talking about psychopaths, yes, physical self-defense is going to be important in some cases, but in the vast majority of cases, the way that they are going to try to manipulate you is all through the mind. Again, because principle of mentalism the all is mind the universe is mental it all starts with your state of mind that's what's important and then the last back aspect of self-governance is alignment with truth meaning you value knowledge over belief you don't just take on belief systems because someone else sold them to you you actually seek knowledge you seek to really understand how it all works how you work and how the universe works this is self-governance now here's the really good news as you and me and all of us as we all embrace self-governance what's going to happen to this psychopathic violent external government that we're under it's going to go extinct. It's going to simply go extinct because it will have nothing to feed off of. It becomes irrelevant. Now, whether it's just going to fade away, become abandoned, whether it's actually going to crash and burn or evaporate, I can't tell you. And that actually, that's not even important how it actually disappears. The only thing that's important is that it will disappear. And like everything in, you know, when you think about when an organism dies, what happens? It decomposes and reality or nature simply absorbs it back in and it gets reused and created. The material gets created into something else, the energy. So that's what's going to happen. So whether it crashes and burns, whether it fades away, whether it's abandoned or whatnot, that part is not important. I don't think we need to focus on that. All we need to know is that it's a natural consequence of us becoming self-governing. That external government just becomes completely irrelevant and it goes bye-bye. And then we can say, bye-bye, see you later. No thank you, arrivederci. Or as I sometimes like to say, Adios, motherfucker. Your choices do matter. Let me say that again. 
Let me say that again because I know there's someone who's still resisting and I, I want to give them the chance. Your choices do matter in opposition to probably what you've been taught up until this point. And you, if you want to find the solution to all this, this point is critical, critical. Your choices, I'm talking to you. I'm not that person over there. I'm talking to you, the one who's watching this presentation right now. Yes, you. Your choices do matter. And things aren't going to change. They will not change unless and until you do. And through the art of influence, since this, since you know this is true for yourself, it also means it's true for everyone around you. So that is why we use influence, as I am right now, to share this message. But you have to do the work on yourself first. You have to at least start. You have to at least start going down that path so that you can empower yourself to be in a position to start sharing this with others. In the meantime, simply share, simply starting that process for yourself and of course sharing this presentation with more people, that is already much more than what most people are doing and that is very valuable. We're here to help each other and we need to have each other's backs. We need to be supportive of each other. I am in no way making any kind of claim or advocacy for any kind of collectivism. So please do not misunderstand me. I am affirming that you are an individual as I am. And in no way do I want to take away your individuality or that of anyone. But we have to be a community in the sense of being supportive of each other. So we can be individuals, sovereign individuals, respecting each other and also supporting each other when we need help. So this is important. Nobody's meant to, to do this all alone. So if you do need help or support, reach out. I'm here to help. Send me an email, david at freedomvibe.art. If you just have a question that you want to share, just comment below this video. But definitely reach out if you feel called to do so. In other words, if you feel like it's, it's genuine, that you'd like some additional support, reach out to me and I'll see in what way I can help you. And, I, and I'm supported by others too. I'm not doing this alone. Others have my back too. Sometimes even just watching and reading their books or watching their content gives me a lot of support. Sometimes it's having a conversation. But ultimately, we're here to help build, help each other grow and help build each other up together as a community. Thank you so much for joining me today. I appreciate that, and I hope you've gotten a lot of value. If you have, I want to invite you, if you haven't done so already, please like this video. That's super important. That small act, which takes less than a second, allows me to share this video with more people. Leave a comment below. Even if even just a quick comment like thanks or thank you or an emoji, whatever it is, subscribe to my channel or follow me depending on where you're watching this video. And please share this presentation with everyone you know, because the more people get exposed to this important knowledge, the better off we're all going to be and the faster we can arrive at the solution for all of us, more freedom. Thank you again, and I'll see you very soon.